Thank you, thank you, Professor Novak. Ladies and gentlemen, now the program uh, starts. Uh, please refer to your official program distributed on the chairs for brief summaries and insights into the uh, great accomplishments of our four speakers. I will not take the time to recount it. You can read, uh, you can read it yourself. Uh, again, the speakers should understand that they are under a, th for the first part of this conference, a 30-minute uh, time limit. Let me now bring to the podium for his presentation on Catholicism and Democratic Socialism, Dr. Charles M. A. Clark, Senior Fellow, Vincentian Center for Church and Society and Professor of Economics at St. John's University, Jamaica, the distinguished Dr. Clark. Joe, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a great honor. Uh, I'll have to tell you that I quite frequently bring up the existence of a Center for Catholic Studies at Nassau Community College when I'm speaking to administrators at the largest Catholic university in America that does not have a Center of Catholic Studies. Uh, so you've been able to accomplish so much, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it certainly says a lot for you but it also sends a lot, says a lot uh, that the Lord does not need a lot of a huge endowment uh, and great facilities in order to do great things. I'd like to start my talk off with a brief apology. When Joe asked me if I would do this program, we lived in a capitalist country and I thought I was going to come here to criticize uh, capitalism. Uh, we had a president who was a social conservative who then became a conservative socialist and started to nationalize industries, you know, anything that wasn't tied down. Uh, so now I'm here to defend George Bush, which puts me in a very unusual position. Uh, I also would like to apologize for the fact, uh, for my profession, uh, for the economists who for the past, particularly last 30, 40 years, have been saying markets work by themselves. You need to deregulate and get out of the way, and the markets will take care of itself. Uh, they perpetuated a market myth and somehow thought it was reality, uh, that that was the actual market that people lived in. Uh, markets, they told us, were natural. They spontaneously coordinated themselves uh, there was a spontaneous order, to use the phrase that uh, Frederick Hayek, von Hayek used to use, and that they were self-regulating, and that greed, they somehow turned greed into the common good. All you had to do was get out of the way. Uh, all they have to do now is look at their 401k statements, and they realize that some markets don't regulate themselves. Uh, some markets need some order brought to them. Uh, but uh, it's really, it's a good example, or a bad example, of what John Maynard Keynes, who I'll be quoting a couple times, wrote at the end of the general theory uh, about the power of ideas and of academic economists and how their ideas, for good and for bad, when they get implemented, get, have a powerful effect. Okay, I always like to start off whenever I talk about Catholic social thought with my favorite line in the Catholic social thought tradition, and I'm pretty certain I'm the only one who thinks that this is the best line in the Catholic social thought tradition, from Leo the Thirteenth, and it's buried at the end of uh, section 14, but he writes, there's nothing more useful than to look at the world as it really is, and at the same time look elsewhere for a remedy to its troubles. And I think that's really key is the first, both parts, but the first part, that Catholic social thought forces us to take a realistic understanding of the reality we're trying to understand, the world as it is. It's not a vision of the world as we want it to be. It's not wishful thinking. It has to, what are the problems? What are the causes of the problems? And I recommend, I often argue that the Catholic social thought tradition is nearly 2,000 years old, but I recommend uh, some of the homilies by St. John Chrysostom on particularly on almsgiving, where he starts off by giving a detailed analysis of why there are so many beggars in Constantinople at that time, and, and what were the factors that were going on that created 
this huge increase, this huge need for almsgiving. Uh, but then, of course, he turns to looking elsewhere for the remedies of the trouble. That is, looking that it isn't just that we need to have solving the economic problems, but these are problems of the heart that need to be changed. And St. John uh, chastises all those who look at the poor and say, you know, there's the reason they're poor, and that's what they're doing wrong, and they deserve it because they're not doing this, and they deserve it because they're not doing that. And he says, ask yourself, what have you done to deserve all that you've had? God has given you so many gifts, what have you done to deserve it? And it's a good way that I think to view how a Catholic social thought uh, approach takes to economic issues. So the reason why, what I'm going to be talking about today is in terms of the Catholic social, uh, democratic socialism, is that I think that the tradition of, of the economists that would be called, and many who classified themselves as democratic socialists, I think that they have done a very good job of understanding modern capitalism as it is in the late 20th century, now the 21st century. That is, the economics of an advanced capitalist economy are just different than the economics of the height of the Industrial Revolution and very different than the economic reality that Adam Smith spoke about. And that this is important. We have to understand that the reality keeps on changing. And so our theories need to change, take into account new phenomena, new institutions, new problems, and also new opportunities uh, that Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill and the great ca classical economists who gave a wonderful defense of laissez-faire economics, uh, but whose reality is just in many ways different than ours. Okay, and then we look to Catholic social thought particularly the principles, to evaluate our reality. You know, are we living up to those principles? That's our yardstick to use. But it's also, the principles are important, that these inform our questions. That it's not just about getting the best outcomes, it's how we get those outcomes. That there's no means to any end. The means are just as important. You know, so we could eliminate statistical poverty in the United States through nationalize all income and then give it out. Everyone gets 43,000 or whatever it is uh, that they would get. And then if we set the poverty line at where it is now, everyone's above it. Uh, now regardless of what impact that might have on future economic growth or any other issues, uh, that violates principles of justice in and of itself. And so how we do things is as important as what we're trying to do. As the great sociologist Werner Stark, a Catholic convert, used to say, you can't separate means and ends because in the end, your, your means create your end. Uh, okay, so when I look at the democratic socialist tradition, I'm looking at the tradition of particularly John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, the reason why I became an economist and why I'm not a lawyer is because I heard Galbraith speak when I was at Fordham, and I said, I got to do that. Uh, but Galbraith, Robert Halbreiner, who was my dissertation supervisor, in terms of schools of thought, the institutional economist. Michael Harrington comes close to this. He was you know, very open, uh, and I think he wrote a book on democratic socialism, if I remember, but coming out of the Catholic tradition. But these economists looked at the economy as a system of power. But that's important. There isn't the market has power and everyone's autonomously bouncing around, and the market takes care of it. No. Markets are instituted. There's no such thing as a natural market. They are instituted by power, by society, by political power. If you look at the actual history of how actual markets come about, there's always someone with a gun there somewhere. And you cannot have markets without someone with force. The fact that I can get into my car and drive home safely, in the end, is based on Nassau community police officer pulling out his gun and stopping someone who tries to steal it. You know, there's always an element of power. And how markets are arranged is how power is instituted. Who we give rights to and who we don't give rights to is very important for how we shape markets. So this tradition doesn't look at the, market, the abstract market as a real thing, but they said, well, let's look at actual markets. Markets can be and have been different.